John K. Sampson is from Winnipeg. Um, I don't think you could get away with a song in which the chorus was, I hate Winnipeg, if you weren't from Winnipeg. Or maybe that's not really true. Maybe that's not actually true. You know, maybe you could get away with writing a song like that and singing a song like that if you weren't from Winnipeg. Um, maybe even somebody from Ontario could do that. Um, but as a novelty song, a satire, a joke. Uh, Stomp and Tom Connors probably could have done it. And we would have loved it at the Sky Dome. Right? The Guess Who Sucks. The Jets were lousy anyway. The magical thing about I Hate Winnipeg and the song that it's from is that it's not a joke. Not at all. It's sincere. It means it. Um, and that you can't do unless you're from there. And of course it also means and says the exact opposite. I love this town. And that you cannot do unless you're from there. The love-hate relationships that we all have with the places that we're from is a relationship that you can only have with the place you're from. Is the volume okay? Is it too loud? It's good? Okay. Half of John K. Sampson's songs are about wanting to leave Winnipeg. All of them are about why he does not leave Winnipeg. Many of them are set in recognizably, specifically, Winnipeg location, so a, a late night restaurant in North Kildonan, a basement bar on Albert Street, um, Grace Hospital on Portage Avenue or under the Disraeli Bridge. They feature local landmarks um, like the Golden Boy, the statue of the Golden Boy that sits atop the Manitoba Legislative Building. Um, they're about local heroes like uh, Reggie Leach, the Métis hockey player that one song wants elected to the Hockey Hall of Fame. They use metaphors drawn from farming, fallow, curling, uh, the local climate, the local geography. They get a lot more metaphoric mileage out of home heating systems than most songs from the East or the West Coast. Radiators hum out of tune on one song. I want to call requests through heating vents, starts another. We take our metaphors from our surroundings, right? They come to us from where we are. It's a good moment, a sad moment, unfortunately, today uh, to remember the first page of Shinwa Achebe's African story, Things Fall Apart. A call close fame spread like a bushfire in the Harmattan, right? Like a bushfire in the Harmattan, the cold wind that blows down from the north. We take our metaphors from our surroundings. Samson's lyrics are not all recognizably set in Winnipeg, but enough of them are that you start to think that they all are, you know, even when they're not apparently set in Winnipeg. Paul Tuff says that every weaker than song is about Winnipeg. And I know what he means. It's always there, under the words, even when it's not in the words. The lyrics on their first album, uh, Fallow, were actually printed over top of a very faint map of Winnipeg. It's the same one that's reproduced on the cover, though whether you can see it up there is doubtful. It's a very faint map in behind the wheat, in behind the word fallow, with the Red River twisting through the top of it. Why would anybody care about these songs if they weren't from Winnipeg? Right, if you didn't know David Reimer from Reggie Leach, why would you care? Why were the folks in Cornerbrook, Newfoundland, happy to hear from John K. Sampson two weeks ago? And why are you people here in Toronto Happy to hear from him in about 45 minutes. Assuming, of course, that you are happy to hear from him in 45 minutes. And why are you happy to hear from him in 45? That was, that was a question. Are you happy to hear from him in 45 minutes? 
Yes. <laughs> to put the question another way, how does the local become universal? So I'm really not sure about this, but I think that the best answer that a writer, an artist, could give to that question is, don't know, don't care. Because I think for the writer, for the artist, doesn't matter where you are, getting the local right is enough. That it's enough to be true to the feelings that you have for the place that you know. Because places are not universal, but feelings are. And if you get the feelings right, then the audience will follow, whether they are in Corner Brook or in Nanaimo, because they will have the same feelings that you do about the places that they love and the places that they hate. In the live recording that I showed you last week, recorded here in Toronto, of uh, the Week of Dance, uh, John K. Sampson performing One Great City, at the end of the song, the end of the performance, John hesitates to finish the last line on the last word. I hate, and he just waits. And some guy out in the audience yells out, Hamilton. <laughs> it's a joke, but it's not a joke. He means it. That guy feels the same way about Hamilton as the song does about Winnipeg. Universal in art is when a drunk guy finishes your sentences. <laughs> he is in very good company. Uh, this is the British singer-songwriter Frank Turner, who's another punk gone folk. I'm from a small town in the rural south of England, and as such, a record about the geography of four roads in the great expanses of Manitoba shouldn't, perhaps, resonate. John's gift is that it does. Within his personal journeys into the heartlands of his landscape, he draws enough truth about the human condition out into the open to connect with anyone who has ever felt alone, awkward, lost, or cold, and indeed, warm, loved, or nostalgic. This is another one. This is John Darnell of the Mountain Goats. And John grew up in a town called San Luis Obispo, which is in coastal California between uh, Los Angeles and San Francisco, and it's not at all like Winnipeg. No matter who you are and no matter where you're from, you know what it's like to hate your town. That's the skeleton of a feeling that by the end of one great city becomes a walking, breathing human being with all the complexity about how you feel about where you're from. That's what's universal, right? Not where you're from, how you feel about where you're from. If you get that right, people will sing the chorus for you. Artists do not make their art universal. Audiences do that. Because we want the song to be about us. We want all the songs to be about us. When you're breaking up, every love song is about you. Or to take a highbrow example, Ulysses, the James Joyce's Ulysses. Weirdly, the book that we have talked about the most in this class that the fewest of us have read or will ever read, including myself. Um, it's a fiercely local novel, or at least what I've read of it. It's one man's hymn, one man's take to his hometown. It's, it's James Joyce's My Dublin um, to John Sampson's My Winnipeg. But generations of readers, critics we call them, have universalized Ulysses. They have made it into the modernist novel. This novel about a city, we've turned it into a novel about us. And I think in significant part we did this to validate the time spent reading it. Imagine, right, reading that thing and thinking, well, that's not about me at all. That would suck. Lyrics and poems um, is not a book. It's a collection of five books written over 15 years. 
This thing took over twice as long to write as it took James Joyce to write Ulysses. That is not a criticism. That is a suggestion to think about how much of a life went into it, 15 years, to think about how much of a life goes into writing songs. It also means, because it's five separate books, it also means that it's a lot harder to do with that what we did with a novel like Lolita or a collection of short stories like Better Living Through Plastic Explosives. That it's difficult for us to pin down the style, to characterize the techniques and affections that define and describe a writer's style, whether they know it or not. Some aspects of a writer's style will no doubt stay with them throughout their writing career, especially those of which they're unconscious. But style also changes from book to book, because it's not the same book and you're not the same person. In the first book, or album, Fallow, in 1997, the stylistic trait that jumps out at me in these, these songs is what grammarians call the imperative mood, the imperative mood. And that is the construction of sentence or verbal constructions that we use to make commands or issue requests like pay attention or please stop here. Those are imperatives. It's a lovely term, right? The imperative mood. These are songs that are in the imperative mood. They're in the mood to make requests. Sometimes the speaker will direct those commands, those requests at himself, the performer, like in the very first song, page 15. Go over your lines. Iron your carefully crafted disguise. Publicly smile and privately frown. Please hear my cries. Sometimes they're directed at others, um, maybe an other. Tell me why I have to miss you so. Ask me the questions you never want answers to. Knock so I'll know you're still there. See, grammatically, those are all imperatives. But the content of them makes them into something different. They're not really commands. They're more pleas. The imperative is also the mood of a prayer. Please explain. Tell me why it hurts. That's the mood of fallow. The second album, uh, Left and Leaving, um, from 2000 is still sometimes in the imperative mood. Um, but this time it seems to me that the hallmark of the style in here is something that we've seen before in this class, and that is the list. And again, the first song sets the stylistic mood. The first song is about a garage sale, and everything must go. I think it's on page 33. Everything must go. I don't know if they say this in Manitoba or not, but my wife's family's from Saskatchewan, and that's what they call leftovers. Must go. Right? What's in the fridge? We're going to have must go. So this is everything must go. Second stanza, a cracked up compass and a pocket watch. Some plastic daffodils, the cutlery and coffee cups I stole from all night restaurants. A sense of wonder, only slightly used. A year or two to haunt you in the dark. A wage slave, 40 hour work week, weighs a thousand kilograms, so bend your knees. Comes with a free freak's big smile for all your dumb demands. The cordless razor that my father bought when I turned 17. A puke green sofa. The outline to a complicated dream of dignity. And a laugh, too loud and too long. It's a collection of apparently random things, right? Like the collection of apparently random things that the boy in number 18 keeps in the coffee jar under the floorboards in John McGregor's If Nobody Speaks of Remarkable Things. Thematically, it's not insignificant that the boy in number 18 wants to keep that stuff, right? That he's trying to hoard it, to collect it. 
whereas John K. Sampson's speaker is trying to get rid of it all. He's doing some house cleaning on a life. But we're talking about style now, not theme. And stylistically, they're the same. They're, 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 they're things, they're lists, bits and pieces that suggest the whole, synecdoche. Page 40. Those second to last stands up. Memory will rust and erode into lists of all that you gave me. A blanket, some matches, this pain in my chest, the best parts of lonely, duct tape and soldered wires, new words for old desires, and every birthday card I threw away. I, you know, I don't think those things actually are random. I think there's an art to the selection. Um, and I don't think the technique is an accident either. And that it's not an accident that that is a favorite technique of these songs and of John McGregor, two writers of the same generation, though in very different places. Because I think the list that might be randomly ordered, but it is not at all randomly selected, is a symptom in art of a condition in our time. And that is a response to all the white noise we've talked about. The too much of everything. The literary list is life on shuffle. In Left and Leaving, um, you get already a bit of what would become the dominant stylistic trait of Reconstruction site and after and that is something that's become a sort of hallmark of Sampson's writing style, and that is the, the mixed and often extended, sometimes at the same time, metaphor, some mixed and extended metaphors. If you look at the title song, page 55. I'm lost. I'm afraid. A frayed rope tying down a leaky boat to the roof of a car in the road in the dark, and it's snowing. If I'm more, then it means less. Last call for happiness. I'm your dress near the back of your knees and your slip is showing. I'm afloat, afloat in a summer parade up the street in the town that you were born in with a girl at the top wearing tulle and a Miss Somewhere sash waving like the queen. That's mixed metaphor. That's metaphor in a blender. But they're all associated. Notice that the different things are all associated. They're connected or linked. From a boat to a float as a verb to a float as a noun. And Samson told us that back in a song on Left and Leaving. He said, your metaphors, as mixed as you can make them, are linked like days together. It's on page 38. And so they are, most of them. The metaphors tend to be linked, associated. If you want as good an example as I've ever seen in a song or a poem of an extended metaphor that is unmixed, that is, stays constant over the course of the song, check out uh, Tournament of Hearts in Reunion Tour. Um, it's a love song, a love story made entirely from curling metaphors. Why can't I draw right up to what I want to say? The biggest change uh, in the lyrics over Samson's last few albums um, is less in their style, I think, than in their genre. For, for myself, and there's room for argument about this, but for myself, uh, song lyrics are not poems, um, but they are descended from the same ancestor, from a time when we did not separate words and music into separate boxes, separate classes, separate stores. The word lyric actually comes from that time, right? From a stringed Greek instrument that the Greeks used to accompany songs or recitations, just reading. Song lyrics aren't poems, but they are poetic. And they're more poetic in one way today than most poetry is. That is, they rhyme which is not true of most poetry. They use poetic techniques routinely, like illusion, like 
irony, like metaphor and simile. They use poetic genres like the elegy, the obad, the dramatic monologue, and especially uh, the confessional, the dominant genre in Western popular music since at least the 1960s. Around about the same time, it became the dominant genre in poetry. The songs on Fallow and in Left and Leaving are mostly written in that vein, in the, the vein of the, the first person confessional lyric spoken by or about the self, uh, the speaker or performer. But starting with reconstruction sites, something interesting has happened, and that is Samson's lyrics have increasingly become artful in another sense. They've become fictional. About, bless you, about fictional characters. Um, or sometimes uh, their stories, fictional stories about real people. So on reconstruction site, for example, we get poems that are spoken by a bunch of old guys at the Elks Club Lodge at Last Call. We get a song spoken by and about a retired Antarctic explorer who's having dinner with Michel Foucault. We get a song spoken by a cat, a cat who is tremendously fed up with his depressed owner that just wants to drink and watch TV all the time. Some of the songs on the album, I don't, maybe all of them, I don't know, but at least some of them for sure are linked in what we would call a song cycle. And I think the song cycle is about visiting somebody in the hospital. I don't know, can't tell if it's somebody who's terminally ill or so perhaps somebody who's been hospitalized for, for mental reasons, some form of depression or a breakdown. At least half the songs on the next album, Reunion Tour, are dramatic monologues spoken by fictional or real people, but not by the singer. Dramatic monologues, including the very first one, which is spoken by a bus driver. There's another one that is spoken by a man who kills himself in a parking lot. That's David Reimer. The one that's spoken by the curler, the lonely curler sitting at the rink, wondering why he's not better at this, relationships. There's one spoken by a guy who saw Bigfoot. And what happens, I think, as you're listening to the record or reading the words, is that enough of them are spoken by fictional characters that you start to think or realize that they're all spoken by fictional characters, even the ones that seem like they might be spoken by their creator, like the one about a tired musician on tour in the title track, that maybe that guy too is also a fiction. Provincial is uh, John K. Sampson's latest album, um, his first solo album. Uh, released just last year, in January. It's what I suppose you'd call a concept album. The concept being to explore four Manitoba highways and um, the stories, or some of the stories that you can encounter along those highways. They're coded on the back of the album. So each one of those symbols represents a particular road or highway, one of the four roads. Um, the songs with diamonds beside them like Heart of the Continent, are set on Route 85, Portage Avenue, the main artery in Winnipeg, and the heart of the continent, as Joanne showed us last week. The songs with the green square beside them are on Highway 23, which leads to the village of Nanette, Manitoba, which leads and led John to the Nanette Sanatorium, um, just outside of Nanette. Uh, that was the province's tuberculosis sanatorium. So for 60 years in the province of Manitoba, if you got TB, that's where you went, um, often to die. The speaker of when I write my master's thesis is writing his thesis about that place. Right? That's the, the fiction, the conceit at work here. The next song, the speaker of 
letter in Icelandic from the Ninette San is a patient there writing to his brother, saying, forget about me. I'll be dead in a year. Move on. I think, maybe just because this is fun to imagine, maybe I read it somewhere and I can't remember, but I think the letter is in the archives that the master's student is working on. Or maybe it's one that he hasn't found yet, that when he finds it, it's the one that's going to let him write my master's thesis. I'll find the evidence. Over uh, 15 years, interests change in artists, not just their style, but interests. Here's Paul Tuff again, writing in 2002 about the week of then's first two albums. Images of revision and construction, of tearing up streets and pulling down buildings and planting a bomb at City Hall and spray painting construction sites are all over John Sampson's lyrics. It's as if he's saying that the only way to stay sane and stay put in a frozen, isolated, broken down city like Winnipeg is to reimagine it, to rip it up and put it back together in your head. It's a great essay, fantastic essay, still the best essay I've ever read on the week of ends, one of the best essays I've ever read on music, period. Um, and he's certainly right about the ubiquity of those images on the first two albums. But I'm not sure he's right about why, about the meaning or significance of all those buildings being torn down or rebuilt. I think that the buildings <laughs> that buildings, pardon me, disappear and reappear in these songs so repeatedly, partly because that's what buildings do in the cities of what is still the new world. Cities that constantly tear themselves down and reinvent themselves. Cities like New York, cities like Toronto, cities like Winnipeg. The Golden Boy is a symbol of all that. Um, he's actually modeled on Mercury the Roman god of commerce. And the torch that he holds is a symbol meant to lead the youth of Manitoba forever forward into a more prosperous future. His weapon is the wrecking ball. In our time, uh, buildings also disappear or have disappeared in our cities for other reasons. Um, Paul Tuff is a Canadian writer uh, who lives in New York City has for some time. In the fall of 2001, these are the lyrics by John K. Sampson that he wrote down and stuck on his fridge from the song I played at the start. My city's still breathing, but barely it's true, through buildings gone missing like teeth. See, he says that even though he knew that the song was about Winnipeg, for Paul Tuff in New York after 9-11, it became about his city, right? About his feelings for his city. Artists don't make their art universal. Audiences do that. Because sometimes we need the song to be about us. I'd be willing to bet that one of the other reasons that buildings keep getting pulled down in Samson's lyrics in the first two albums especially, is because you can take the punk out of the punk band, but you can't really take punk out of the punk. Um, the Weaker Thans are not as aggressive a band musically as Propagandy was, but the songs are still pissed off some of the time. You know, they're still quietly angry, even though they're now capable, as Propagandy is now, of laughing gently at their own anger. In songs like Pamphleteer, or Confessions of a Futon Revolutionist. When Samson sings, let's plant a bomb at City Hall, I really believe that some part of him means that, that some part of him still wants that. I swear I more than half believe it when I say that somewhere love and justice shine. But for all that Samson's songs are quite clearly products of their society, and in some cases protests against that society. 
I don't think they're either really protest songs or social realism, but that's not really what they're up to. I think they are primarily vehicles for emotion, for the representation and communication of feelings, the job of the lyric, not ideas, not facts. In, in 1994, the Prince Edward Island-born poet Mark Strand, um, now an American poet, published a, a very good book of art criticism on the American painter Edward Hopper. The book is called Hopper. And Strand, in this book, argues against what has become the dominant reading of Edward Hopper, the painter. That is, that Edward Hopper is a realistic painter, that his paintings are social documents of mid-century America. Strand says, well, OK, maybe a bit. But that's not really what makes them so great. That's not what we love about them. This is what he says in part. He says, it is my contention that Hopper's paintings transcend the appearance of actuality and locate the viewer in a virtual space where the influence and availability of feelings predominate. Now, Samson has obviously read this book. He quotes from it in Sun on an Empty Room, one of two songs on reunion tour that is both named after and after, in Michael Lista's sense, paintings by Edward Hopper. And I would be willing to bet that this is one of the books on Hopper that gets brought to the person in the hospital on reconstruction site. But more importantly, I think that's exactly what John Sampson's lyrics do. They transcend the appearance of actuality, the real Winnipeg streets and landmarks that they name. And they locate the listener in a virtual space where feelings predominate, not facts, not places. And that's why people who aren't from Winnipeg can identify with them. Why you do not have to have lived in New York of the 1930s to be moved by Hopper's paintings, like that one most famously, Nighthawks, 1942. Because it's not a real diner. It's a virtual diner created and made possible by art, only in art, which makes it a diner that anybody can visit, just like the one in North Kildonan. Mostly, I think, that the many images of tearing down buildings and rebuilding buildings on the first two Weaker Than's albums, I think they're just that. I think they're virtual spaces for exploring emotions, metaphors for the tearing down and rebuilding of the self. In the later albums, there's less of this. There's less destruction, less desire to tear things down. There's more reconstruction, more reunions, more renovations, or just living with it in an old house with blowing fuses and the taps reversed, with our taps reversed, the last song. He's not alone anymore. That helps, too. Over all of Samson's albums, one interest has stayed constant, at least one. One question has stayed the same, and that is, what is home? Remember Nomi Nichols' condition in Miriam Taves' novel, A Complicated Kindness. Nomi says that she is homesick at home, homesick at home. It's a perfect phrase. She doesn't mean she's homesick for home. She's at home and homesick there. So are Samson speakers and characters over and again. The epigraph for the first album, Fallow, from Catherine Hunter. Being born is the easy part. It's the staying here that's difficult. And just like Taves' characters in all of his novels, her, her novels, Samson's characters, including his own, are constantly leaving and returning, spending time in bus stations, 
playing on the luggage carousels at airports, counting the highway lines to home. In one song, one song title, they're anchorless, anchorless. In another, they're exiles. The room in sun and an empty room is empty because they're packed up, they're moving, about to become homeless, like the students in John McGregor's novel. Page 38. Sorry, I'll try to stop breathing. Last three lines. I love this place. The enormous sky and the faces, hands that I'm haunted by. So why can't I forgive these buildings, these frameworks labeled home? That's homesick at home. That's Nomi's condition, exactly. But I wouldn't read too much into the coincidence of them both being from Manitoba. Um, it's not a condition that's confined to the prairies. We are all, as I've been arguing since January, a little bit homesick at home these days. We're all trying to figure out how to feel at home, even when we are at home. This is the, the key for the songs on Provincial, the one that tells you which songs are on which roads, except for the last one. Home. X marks the spot, the treasure that we're all looking for. Home. For 15 years now, um, John Sampson's songs have been helping us articulate how we feel about the towns and the cities where we're from, the places that we love and hate. In the last song on the last week of that album, the speaker says that he wishes that he were something useful, like a toothbrush or a soldering iron. The last line of the last song on the last week of that album is about the song, and I think about all the songs before it. It says, make this something somebody can use. Make this something somebody can use. I think we have. We have, John. And that's why we put your words on our fridges, and that's why we yell them back at you in bars. <clears throat> Let's take a break there. When we come back, uh, John Sampson will join us. <laughs> 